<laughs> Welcome, everybody. My name is Tom Bruitt. I am the acting director of New Works here at Theatre Works, and I am very excited to welcome you to the 2013 Meet the Festival Artist Panel. Before I introduce the panel and ask some questions, I wanted to just tell and announce a few things. So there has been a little bit of confusion about the raffle for the uh, <laughs> container store. There is not a code word today. Uh, however, I wanted to give some hints about what the code words may be um, and, and what to do once you have gotten all five code words. So once you have all five code words, you're going to email them to the email address audience at theaterworks.org. Again, that's audience at theaterworks.org. There is a little poster in, if you go out this left door here, there's a little poster that, that describes all of this and you can write the information down. What you're going to email is your name, your uh, best contact phone number, and your email address, and then what are the five code words. Um, so, the five code words should be, in this order, Grand Opening Sales Benefit Theater Works. Okay? So we encourage you all to, after this, to submit those. Um, we are unfortunately not eligible. If you have been in a Theater Works play, if you are part of the festival in any way, you are not eligible to enter. Um, but if you have come to the, the festival, you are eligible to enter. Um, one last bit of uh, business. So this panel is being live streamed on HowlRound TV, so people around the country and around the world can watch this today. Um, it will also be archived if, if there's something really interesting that you, that you heard and you want to listen to it again. You can go to HowlRound.org and there's, uh, you'll, you'll look for HowlRound TV and you can go into the archives and find this, um, find this program. Also, so people, or people who are not here today can uh, tweet questions in, or if you are a little bit shy and you don't want to ask a question into the microphone, you can also tweet your questions from your seats today. <laughs> Sophie Burke, our lovely intern, please raise your hand, Sophie, will be following our Twitter feed. Um, and, and all you have to do is put, put hashtag 2013NWF. So again, that's hashtag 2013NWF or hashtag new play. So hashtag 2013NWF or hashtag new play. If you put that on, on your tweet, the questions will go directly to Sophie, she'll flag me down, and then um, I will ask the questions. So we're just gonna do a little panel. I'll, I'll ask some questions and then at the end, we'll have some people in the, in the audience that will, that will get your questions. Um, so, so save them up to the end. All right, first I wanted to just go down the panel and, and introduce everybody. So please just say your name and which piece that you wrote. James Sasser, a writer and lyricist for Kuba Moore. Um, Charles. <laughs> please hold your applause to the end. <laughs> My name is Charles Vincent Burwell. I'm the composer and lyricist for Kuba Moore. Hey. <laughs> Directions. Uh, Beth Hinley, the writer of A Laugh. Uh, David West Reed, The Great Pretender. Laura Marks, I wrote Gather at the River. Janine Neighbors, book writer for Mrs. Hughes. And I'm Sharon Kenny, the composer lyricist for Mrs. Hughes. All right, take a moment. All right, so the first question I'm going to ask. Um, the plays and the musicals have had different time periods out here, so the plays have uh, rehearsed for three or four days, did a reading, had a day off, went back into rehearsal for two or three days and did another reading, and the musicals were here for five days, they did a reading, they had a day off to do some, some work, went back into rehearsal for two days, a reading, and back into rehearsal for two days and a reading. I wondered if you could uh, talk a little bit about how that process was helpful to you in your, your particular piece. And we can just go out of order, anybody that, that wants to jump in. <laughs> or I'll call names. <laughs> Laura, what about you? Why don't you start? Sure, I'll, I'll go. Um, uh, well, typically uh, a lot of the readings that I've done have been a thing where you just rehearse for a couple of hours that day and then you do the reading. And so there isn't really time to experiment with different versions of a line, different versions of a scene. Uh, this felt like a really luxurious amount of time to sit with the play, try new things. If something doesn't work the first time, 
well, is it the writing or should we try, you know, an exhaustive list of choices to make this work? So it's really been just a great experience being here and thank you all so much for having us. Anybody else? What about a musical team? Can, can well, a lot of times with the reading of the musical, uh, you're on what's called a 29-hour contract, which means you have 29 hours ostensibly to learn everything, stage it, and perform it. And that's barely enough time to learn all of the music, probably look at it once or twice, tops. So to have five days to learn the music and then also have time to work on the script, by the time we were getting to our second reading, we were having the luxury of doing very specific character work and looking at the choices internally, similar to the process that you guys had, and, and that, that's just invaluable to us because there's so many moving parts to a musical that you can change one line and it completely affects a song that follows it differently. And the song might not have been working, but the moment before could have led into it differently, and we found that time to just be invaluable to have all of those different options. What about you guys then on the end, Mrs. Hughes? Yeah, um, Janine and I came into this process with, uh, with the idea that we were essentially going to throw out our second act that we were coming in with. So she was actually in Chicago at Steppenwolf for that, those first five days. So we presented our, our draft uh, that we had been working on since June. And then we both kind of looked at it with fresh eyes and then took the second week to really tear it apart and experiment with, with the things that we had had in mind. And I think um, having a reading on Thursday was really helpful to kind of see, you know, are our ideas working? Are we going in the right direction? And then having a second reading today, I think, I think we feel pretty great about the progress that we've made and it's been fast and furious, but this, this isolated time has just been completely invaluable to, you know, being in the room together. And, and there's so many things that we can talk about with each other, but to actually see them and hear them and, and, and feel the emotional progression as it's happening in the room is, is just really, rare and special, so it's been, it's been really wonderful. I would love, I'm so curious to, to talk a little bit about uh, where the ideas for some of these pieces came from. Uh, Dave, could you share, share where you're? Sure. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Canadian, and I grew up uh, with a show called Mr. Dress Up, uh, <laughs> which is <laughs> uh, kind of like the Canadian Mr. Rogers. Um, except that his shtick was that he dressed in costumes every, every day and he had a tickle trunk from which he <laughs> pulled out these costumes and uh, like the character in the, in the play, the young lady, I used to turn my family's furniture into whatever Mr. Dressup was making and do the crafts and, they, and I feel like this was the start of my theater making, <laughs> I was just, you know, wouldn't be here if not for Mr. Dressup. So um, I was interested in that world and, um, and also interested in, I had done a play before about grief, a kind of sadder, well maybe not, <laughs> another play about grief but in the more immediate aftermath and I wanted to do a play about kind of the next stage of grieving as someone is trying to move on and uh, find a, a replacement or not for that hole that's been left in his life. That's great. What about you, Laura? <laughs> oh, um, well, <laughs> uh, I'm from Kentucky, and uh, I was in graduate school recently with actually the people who are on either side of me right now, <laughs> Dave and Janine were my classmates at Juilliard. Um, one of our teachers there, Marcia Norman, is also from Kentucky, and I've always wanted to write something that was set in Kentucky, at least partially, and I knew I wanted to do it while I had Marcia there to keep me on track, so. Yeah, I guess that was the start of it. Also, I got an email, very similar to the email that starts the play. <laughs> so quite honestly, when I started writing it, I didn't even know I would end up in Kentucky, but uh, when I got there, I thought, oh, how nice, I'm home. <laughs> and Beth, could you share where the idea for, for Laugh came from? Um, well, I think it was in uh, reaction to a play I wrote called The Jacksonian, which is very dark and has um, a murder. It takes place in a motel in Jackson, Mississippi in 1964, which is a very kind of violent time. Um, and it was really hard to write that play. And when I finished it, I just thought maybe I won't write any play again, because I started looking at what there was to write about in the world around me, and it was all making me a little too upset. 
so I um, started watching these old films and started thinking about how subversive it would be to write a play that made people laugh <laughs> <laughs> and make myself laugh. And um, the play, the lead characters in the play, Mabel and Roscoe, are, are kind of a, a nod to Mabel Norman and um, Fatty Roscoe Arbuckle, who used to do films together. Um, so I just had, you know, months in front of YouTube to inspire me. <laughs> and a lot of the actors said that they could not have done that reading without YouTube, because uh, both, both Sarah and, and Jeremy were, I guess, you know, glued to YouTube for the, the week that they were working on that piece. What about you guys? Could you share uh, Cuba more? Where did that idea come from? Um, I was fortunate enough in my former life as a performer to, uh, to travel to Cuba. And uh, it's one of those things where you go someplace with a preconceived idea of what the culture is, and you arrive there and you find that it's completely different. And when we came back, um, I got to know a gentleman named Joshua Bialafia, who had been there a few years before I had, and he created a film, Cuba Amor, based on his experience there. And the experiences were so similar, but yet they were so different from everything that we'd been told about Cuba. So it stuck with me, I'm, the music, the, spiritual, the spirituality, and all of those situations that Cubans and Americans deal with when they're trying to get to know one another. So uh, I brought the idea to James when we were in grad school at uh, NYU's musical theater writing program. And uh, James was uh, very excited about the prospect of an idea of doing something that had a social foundation but that was accessible to everybody because it was dealing with something that we all deal with, which is love. And that's how we decided, okay, well, let's do a love story about Cuba while incorporating the music, the spirituality, the different personalities, the language, and the passion that exists within Cuba. I had always wanted to go to Cuba as well. I've made a, a point of trying to work on projects to go to places that people tell me I'm not allowed to. Um, Which is great when we try to come through customs. Exactly. <laughs> so I, when we decided to work on the project, uh, I, my father used to be a public affairs officer for the military, and we had friends in the State Department. And through them and the NYU Office of Globalization, I looked into getting a visa. And within three weeks, we had a visa and a grant, and we went. Uh, because I told Vince that if I was going to be writing about Havana, I, I needed to know what the air smelled like, what were the restaurants to avoid, cobblestones, all of that kind of stuff. You found them. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was our inspiration. That's great. And Sharon and Janine, could you talk a little bit about how Mrs. Hughes uh, came about? Yeah, every year, uh, Williamstown Theater Festival in Massachusetts uh, commissions one play and one musical. And uh, they came to us and for the commission, in order to get to the commission, you have to pitch them an idea. And we knew that we were supposed to pitch something and Sharon called me one night with this really interesting uh, story of Sylvia Plath. And we had both been a, kind of obsessed with her, but we didn't know the story of the couple that sublet their flat, but kind of ended up um, changing her and Ted's lives forever. And so that was the pitch that we kind of took to Williamstown. And when we got that opportunity, we had, we pitched it in January of last year. And then between January and June, we could outline, but we couldn't write a single, a single word of it. Right. And the then, whole stipulation of the fellowship yeah. at Williamstown is not one note, not one word on the page. Right. So they essentially want you to show up and write the piece in four weeks. And then they, it results right. in a workshop production, which is and they cast, a rough idea. I'll it's a rough right. idea. <laughs> <laughs> and they cast it for you, so you have no idea who you're going to end up with, Ted Hughes or Sylvia Plath. And you basically go there, and you just write the entire thing in three weeks. And then they stage it for two weeks. And it's this huge production. And it's just, so we knew what we were getting into with that. And that's kind of what, so we knew that like if, if it failed, at least it would fail there. And if it's a safe place. <laughs> And if it has a life, at least then it will then it will have a life. So we kind of just decided to go with right. this very ambitious idea um, because we had that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> in each of obviously in, in the musicals, music is is um, inherently important. Um, 
I wondered if, if uh, each, of, uh, each of our playwrights today could talk a little bit about how music is working in your process here at TheaterWorks. And then I wondered if uh, Sharon and, and uh, Vince, if you guys could talk about the uh, musicians that you had, the percussion for Cuba Moore and the cello for Mrs. Hughes, if you could talk just a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so Beth, you could probably start. <laughs> I, I was really surprised. I knew um, that my play Laugh would really benefit from music. Um, and when David Schweitzer, the director, suggested that uh, we get a composer in there, I was half thrilled and half terrified because I thought it's such a short time. What is a composer gonna do? But luckily, um, we got Wayne, and he just happens to ha have an affinity for the time and place. He knows all the old movies, all the old music, uh, and he couldn't have been more right for this and more giving and just a joy, a joy to work with. So it was, and David had worked with him before and he, he knew this. And I just think it made all the difference in the piece to, to, have, to have that music. Uh, uh, the, for the music for the Mr. Feld show, um, I had written the lyrics and then we were doing a workshop at Juilliard and the director thought it would be, would add something to actually have the music. So we, he gave it to his friend Patrick Barnes who works uh, for the 52nd Street Project, which is uh, in New York, it's uh, kids write their own plays and then they bring in professional New York actors to act them out. And it's, very exciting for them. And, uh, he doesn't know I'm using his music here. Um, he probably you know, does now. He may be watching the live stream, um, which you'll find out. And he'll get paid if I, if I eventually do this. You know, and I'll make sure that he's credited. But for now, we're just using his stuff. And um, the music uh, directors here were fantastic, but kind of too good because um, this show is supposed to be, the music is so simple. And, you know, Wayne would adding all these arrangements and jazzing it up and turning it into a Broadway number. And we're like, you know, the, on the Mr. Feld show, they were not that good. Um, so it, it, it had to have that feel of the spontaneous, you know, it's a guy sitting off stage just kind of trying to follow along with a totally unscripted uh, children's show. So it was a very specific kind of music that we wanted. And uh, it was great to have people here who could deliver that. And Laura, you don't have a music director, no. but... No, there's not a lot of music in my play. There's one song, um, and it comes at a kind of pivotal moment in the play. To me, it's sort of the hinge of the play, where you kind of flip over a little. Um, uh, so, and it's a cappella, so there wasn't really uh, much to do on that score. But I love that song. I'm always excited when we get around to it, so... Sharon, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the cellist and, and why you decided to go with, with yeah, cello? Yeah, I mean, well, first it, it really came out because it was being done at Williamstown and they were like, you can have maybe two instruments, so there wasn't a lot to choose from. And obviously I'm a, I'm a pianist and I write on the piano, so that's my main vehicle for, for writing. And I, um, I just, I felt really strongly about adding the cello because I think that it adds a richness and a darkness tonally to to the piece that is really imperative. Um, and I, in the writing of the score, I, it's actually kind of become the voice of Sylvia to me, uh, even in, in the first act when she is living. I don't, well, I don't wanna spoil the, it's fine, she dies. And she, <laughs> and then when she <laughs> comes back. Well. When she comes back, you know, in the in the second act, just not physically but emotionally, and you know what that what that voice and that that presence is. I just I think that I've always loved the cello so much, particularly with you know against a piano. I think it's just so. Uh, I, I, I there's no there are no words for it. You know, I, I just think it's so expressive and beautiful, and it can inform the emotion of the piece in a way that is really essential to it. And Vince? Um, with Cuba, when I was there, I was, I was enthralled by the rhythmic, rhythmic pulse of the culture. There's rhythm everywhere. James and I would sit on the, on the roof of Hemingway's hotel, and you could hear music over here, you hear drumming over here, you hear congas over here, bongos over here, clave over here. 
and it was so synonymous with the culture of Cuba. It helps that I'm a percussionist. <laughs> but during this process, it was really uh, enjoyable to sit back and not play and uh, listen to Billy work with the percussionist that we brought in, who Javier was amazing, and, and create that tapestry. It, there's a, it's, it's almost like a part of the scenery, the music. And without that rhythmic pulse, it's, it's, not, it's not Cuba. So working with them and having the opportunity to put some time into seeing how the piano, and Billy coming from a very musical theater background, and watching him become a Cuban pianist. This is Billy Libertor. Right. Yes. Wonderful. And wonderful experience. And watching him become a Cuban pianist with the percussion, it was, it was a beautiful thing to sit back and watch. A side story about a percussionist, if I can jump in. Sure. So we, we initially were bringing a percussionist who was a mentor of Vince's, uh, Sekou Alawe from Brooklyn with us. And uh, his wife is having a baby. So at the last minute, he wasn't able to come. And he made a recommendation uh, for Javier Navarrete, who ended up playing for us. And uh, we had one rehearsal with Javier where he just played through the music once with Billy and with the singers. And we then, he came back the next day where we did our, our tech rehearsal. And at the break for intermission, uh, we walked backstage and Vince sees Javi and he's sitting with his head in his hands, kind of rubbing his face. And Vince went over to check with him to see what was going on. And Javier looks up at him and says, um, the guy who made this movie, uh, I, I went with him to Cuba 20 years ago, and it turned out that Tata, the grandfather, is Javier Navarrete's godfather. So, and we had no idea when we got that <laughs> recommendation. So for a story of about family, for us to be on the other side of the country with a totally random, but there are no coincidences, recommendation, <laughs> Uh, it, it really kind of landed home, the central idea of family for us with this story, both musical family and family family. So yeah. That's beautiful. I wondered if you could share just one really surprising thing that you discovered uh, in each of your processes out here um, the past two weeks. Uh, I discovered an amazing young actress. We have a gal in our company who is, how old is Maddie? 17. 17? I think. Um, I, I can barely tie my shoes when I was 17. I mean, she's just, <laughs> she's so wonderful, and I think that you'll be uh, hearing a lot more from her in the years to come. She's heading off to college in the fall. Madeline Ruverall is her name, so, yeah. I mean, I guess I would say Steve Sanders, who was our music director, who was just amazing and wonderful, and I felt like he was in my brain, and figuring things out before I could even ask him to do them. And it was just so wonderful to be supported, you know, in that, in that way, both musically and emotionally, because it is kind of scary a little bit when you're, you know, presenting new things to the room that are not fully realized. And to have, you know, a, a teammate there and, and, a, and a, fully, a full team is really, is, is extremely helpful. And in Williamstown, didn't you music direct as well as? Uh... Yeah, because I was like <laughs> writing them like five minutes before I would teach them. So there was like no music written down. So it, it, was, a, it was a lot. <laughs> yes. Were you going to say something else? Um, I was uh, really surprised by the support of the community. I was pretty amazed when they said they were going to do readings of plays. I was thinking, well, maybe 10 people will come, and why would they? Uh, and then I saw, oh, no, they're actually charging money. Nobody <laughs> uh, But to, to be with this so much support for this theater and for new writers uh, and new musicals is pretty overwhelming, uh, and, and it was really quite a surprise. Yeah, I was also, I, I had heard about the uh, audience feedback, and I'd been prepared for that, but um, have not. Um, I think it's kind of unique the way that theater works, involves their audience so much, and allows them the opportunity to give very detailed responses to the reading, and I read all of them. Because normally I'm standing at the back kind of eavesdropping as people come out, and then you may get things like, <laughs> Um, unrelated to the play, you know, and, or um, you kind of focus on these little um, 
tidbits you hear, which uh, before people have time to kind of process and compose their full answers. So to get those beautifully written responses, they were it was very uh, touching. Uh, the the thoughtfulness uh, that uh, people put into the responses and 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 very helpful um, because you so often want to just kind of go inside the brains and see what is working and what isn't and uh, so that's a great opportunity. I was surprised that you all really do in your heart like rap music. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't worry, I'm not going to tell anybody, but. Uh, <laughs> But, but it was it was refreshing um, to for you guys for for the audience to get it. And I was concerned about all types of things that I need not be concerned about. Are they going to understand the the dialogue? Are they going to understand the medium? Are they going to hate the character because he's rapping? And it turned out that that uh, that uh, especially in those responses, which meant again so much to us. Um, about how, how we organize our, our, our work and what was landing, that the character that was rapping was one of the most loved characters and most understood. And that was a surprise for us. So then we had to go fix, every, fix everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do want to echo that. I think the audience here has been like incredibly generous. And I think Sharon and I came into this process thinking that the entire audience would walk out. <laughs> At some point. I did not think that. <laughs> <laughs> because this is very much a musical about Sylvia Plath, and I think it is a little polarizing, and people don't know what to think. But I, I, I really just think everyone goes for the ride, and it's just been really, really, really surprising and great. And it's just been a wonderful experience. As a writer, you spend so much time in a vacuum within your own process. And it, to be able to have both the response of the immediate room of amazing people, directors, writers, actors, musicians that you're working with, but then also to have three opportunities to have this kind of exchange with the energy, because what we do doesn't exist without this live audience, with, without you here. And that, that kind of feedback is so vital for us. I wondered if uh, you could share just sort of one change that you made over the course of your time out here that has been pretty impactful. Uh, <laughs> has there been one thing that sort of, sort of comes to the... <laughs> Act two. <laughs> <laughs> Act two twice, right? <laughs> uh, I, I'd have to think more about what was the most impactful, but just the most recent change, I can tell you. Um, uh, there's a, a scene in which Reverend Bill uh, says, shoot, but uh, it, for some reason in our reading the other day, it came out sounding like he said shit. And I, I could hear the audience just recoil. They didn't want this nice reverend to swear, and I didn't either. So, um, <laughs> so just to make it absolutely not confusing that he would not say shit, we changed it to doggone it. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of something equally interesting that I did, <laughs> but I think for me it was mostly uh, cuts and and uh, um, and deepening characters because um, especially the Tom character who is the uh, director of the show. I actually just reassigned some of Carol's lines to him <laughs> because Carol was speaking so much. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it had to do with um, sometimes you don't kind of, you know where the characters are going to end up, but it's about building the, the arc and uh, not the Noah's arc, the, the, the character arc. Um, and uh, <laughs> that was probably clear. Um, <laughs> and uh, I felt like, you know, t uh, this is so technical and I'm, uh, now I'm just saying it anyway, but, th but Tom has this whole f interest in children's television, which he eventually reveals has nothing to do with television, it's about the people that he gets to work with. And I laid much more of that in early in the play. And then also working with the actors over the week, they got much better at the puppets uh, because there's parts in the play where they're supposed to be uh, unskilled 
and then there were parts where it was, they had just got the puppets the day before, and so they were unskilled. Uh, so uh, that's, those are the things we really worked on. We, we cut a song um, the, our second to last day of rehearsal uh, that had ended up being the last of the five original songs that we had written for the piece. The only theme of music that is ex existent now in the show that was from any of our original ideas for the piece is the Mikuba theme from the opening and the closing. And uh, when our amazing director, Kent Nicholson, who was so revolutionary with us, all, all puns intended, um, when he made the suggestion, the look on Vince's face looked like somebody had shot him with an arrow. And it's my song. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'll never forget that moment, but it, and it, it, it completely changed the first act, and, and it worked so well. And, and just that feeling of, of sacrifice and letting go, we realized that we had our own Lazaro moment of that, yeah. and, and it, was, it was amazing. But to be able to let go of that in, in a safe environment and feel the support of everybody in the room kind of urging you that it's okay, it's gonna be better, um, was kind of an amazing feeling. Which is a great thing about this situation. We have the we have the opportunity to completely and utterly fail and mess up. <laughs> and then you have another opportunity to fix it. And that's, that's, that's unique. So, yeah. All right, I wanted to open it up uh, to a couple questions from the audience or Twitter. Do we have any, any tweeted questions? No? <laughs> Uh, so uh, Kimberly Moss and, and Jim Gross will be in the aisles. If anybody has a question, just raise your hand so I can, I can see it. Uh, all right, one back, back there, Jim. Or I guess Jim already. Okay. So um, I saw um, the Sylvia Plath play before you did much of the second, or maybe you already did change the, the second act the first time it was performed. But I was very curious about if there were other changes and if it's, okay to say what they are. I don't know if it's... So did you see it Thursday, or the, the, the first performance on uh, last Sunday? Week. Last weekend, yeah. Sunday? Last weekend, yeah. okay. We, we had talked a lot about the structure of Act Two, and in life after Sylvia Plath's suicide, Asia moved into her flat two days after she died and started caring for Ted and his children, her, his children, and then, you know, eventually had her own child with Ted. And we started the act like that for a very, very long time. And something about her, we, you know, we were always trying to figure out how to make her sympathetic because we always knew that the second act would essentially be her story. And rather than starting with them together right away, which is what happened, which was what the version was on Sunday, uh -huh. we decided to to tear them apart. And that's kind of what the structure of act two is. So it kind of has this like hourglass shape where it starts with them being apart and then they come together, then they ultimately fall apart again. And I think that that helps with, with the sympathy of the characters because you have to find something to root for and in act two you have to, because Sylvia's gone, you can't root for, for her to be with anyone, you have to root for Ozia and Ted, so. right. We felt that it was coming off, if they, if they started the act together, that it was, it, it was kind of painting them as callous and, right. and not responsive to what had just happened and, and what they had caused. Um, so we thought that you know, it would color them much better to have them, to see, you know, we are guilty about this and we, we do feel terrible and we're, we're going through this too and we're not just carrying on with our lives as if nothing ever happened. That's great. Okay, Sophie, you said that we have a, a tweeted question. Okay, so the question is, what has been the most um, unexpected response to your play, useful or not? <laughs> unexpected, so. I, I, I think, like Beth said, I just didn't expect that 400 people would show up to see it. You know, I mean... Go theater works. It's really <laughs> nice. All right, Kim, do you have somebody back there? I do. This is for um, the Mrs. Hughes playwright and lyricist. 
Um, did you base any of your songs on any of Sylvia Plath's works? No. So, first of all, I think that to attempt to <laughs> to sound like I, I mean, no one writes Sylvia Plath better than Sylvia Plath. So from, I mean, besides rights issues and everything like that, we really just wanted to make this an isolated kind of piece and, and do, you know, it's more of the internal voice as opposed to the concentrated poetry of, you know, things that she labored for hours and hours and hours over. Um, so it's more of like the, the emotional expression. It kind of, you know, in her, of course I try to capture her language, um, but, but no, I, we haven't set any, any of the poems to song. I also think that her poems exist so beautifully as is, and they're not written to be sung, and I think that they exist in their best form as a poem, um, whereas a song, you know, a, a poem you can, you can look at and kind of digest and take, and take time to really analyze, and as a song, you're hearing it for the first time and it's moving so quickly that I think that it's a, it's a different medium um, that wouldn't translate as well as, you know, as beautifully as she has put them in a poem. Yeah, and Carol Hughes, uh, the woman that he that Ted actually marries in, at the end of the musical, is still living, and so he, she very much has owns the rights to his estate. And Sylvia Plath, their one surviving child, um, has the rights to their estate. So I think it's it would be really tricky to kind of um, uh, to to figure out how we would use that. Yeah, somebody from over here. Jim. <clears throat> this is my first time to attend the Theatre Works New Plays Festival, and it was so illuminating in that I came to realize that stage readings are an art in, it, in and of themselves. <laughs> um, so, Ms. Henley, I was curious as to whether the front, frontal presentation of your piece towards the audience was something that was developed in the rehearsal room or whether that was in the script? Um, that was um, uh, d developed in rehearsal. It was, they did the director's choice to try to get some sense of the, of the flatness and, and the style, because it's not a, a naturalistic play in any sense. And just to try to get, get the audience in, into that fact. Um, was his choice, and I think it worked. It really did. It was as if the play became a film, and the, it was a point of view shot from the audience, for the audience. So thank you. That's great. Thank you. All right, right over here, Kim. Yep, right. Yes, this relates to the, uh, the feedback forms. I found them, for, for me, very useful and uh, very enjoyable, and made me think more about the plays and, and got a lot more out of it by answering the questions. Um, uh, what I wanted to comment on now, the third question particularly, since I just saw the play today, <laughs> Mrs. Hughes, and fill out the questionnaire at lunch, the third question really got me thinking about what is the play about? What's the story about? And I wonder if you can answer that without divulging the answer to the quiz here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know what I answered on it, but I, but I wanted Well, Janine just whispered to me that she thinks I should answer this question, so I don't know. <laughs> What is the, I mean, I think the play is about a lot of things, and I think because we're taking a historical event that we think is, is theatrically and, is theatrical and very, I mean, it's clearly emotionally ripe, um, I think that we're still figuring out the story that we want to be telling through this piece. Um, we have a lot of things that we think it's about. I think it's about, you know, I mean, Suicide, it's like Sylvia's, here's a woman who's mentally ill and her suicide was in a way unavoidable. And then there's another woman who falls into the same fate, but she's essentially a victim of circumstance. And I think that those two questions, you know, how do these women who start off on opposite ends come to this very, the exact same ending through completely different paths? I think that is fascinating and I think that the hope eventually is to, I mean, raise awareness is a little bit strong, but to, to kind of like, to raise some compassion in people. I think that the, I was saying earlier today that when you hear someone takes their own life, the, the easy response is, oh, they must be so crazy. And I actually think that's not true at all. I think that 
the harder truth of it is that this could be you or this could be me and it could be anybody. And we actually don't know what people are struggling with. And I think that this piece, eventually, the hope is that it will it will bring that to light and kind of you know raise compassion in people to, to understand that. Well, that's not quite the answer I had, but I'll turn, <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it in anyway. <laughs> Great. Anybody? All right, we have one right in the middle back there, Jim. Can you, can you reach back there? Gathering has a lot of technology references, iPads and cable and the best line of the play, I blog. <laughs> the, the, what's the challenge you have as playwrights to incorporate this volatile world of change in something that is so funny today but will be stale tomorrow? And how does it reflect on your choices? That's, that's a really good question and a good point, yeah. Um, I once took a class with this playwright, Will Eno, and I remember him saying, never put brand names in your play. You want your play to last you know, forever, God willing. Um, <laughs> but uh, the fact is, you know, I, we're just sort of writing, <laughs> and that's the world that we see, and so we're speaking to it, I think. Um, so it's kind of, for me, I find it very hard not to uh, pepper a play with contemporary references. Um, you know, if that means the play is obsolete in two years, that's, that's gonna be a bitter pill, but oh well. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else wanna talk about that question? Well, we have the interesting issue that change is happening so rapidly in Cuba, and so much has already changed in the last two years since our first trip there. If the blockade comes down tomorrow, uh, we have a wonderful little historical snapshot of what life was like in Cuba in 2012, 2013. And that's something that we've struggled with, of do we constantly update and try to keep it now, today, present day? Because that was one of the things that we really wanted to explore, was today's Cuba, not Carmen Miranda, Guys and Dolls Cuba. Um, so that, that's kind of as well for us, if it's obsolete in two years, we'll equate it to be in the same canon of shows like Cabaret, that capture a snapshot of a historical era right before it radically changes. Anybody else have anything? Yeah. My play is a period piece. <laughs> <laughs> Set in the year 2001. Um, but it, with, I, in addition to avoiding the fact that each year could be, like, it's already out of date. I don't need to worry. Um, but uh, I said it at the time when Dora the Explorer was just beginning and all the shows like Mr. Dressup and Captain Kangaroo and Mr. Rogers were ending. And the kind of, uh, the point where the man and his puppet friends met the cartoon and the dinosaur and all of that interests me. So that's why I said it when I did. And I avoided technology that way because uh, it was less of an issue, I think. I think it's really hard to write. I mean, I respect Will Eno, and I think that that is a, I think that that's a very valid point, but I, I do think it's hard to kind of not write for your time and your experience. Like, if you are, especially when you're just trying to figure out what your voice is as a writer, you have to write about what you know and what, what draws you to write to begin with, and I think that there's a reason why you see a zillion plays of Shakespeare, and they're always setting them in, like, periods like today and why like Romeo and Juliet is happening with like Orlando Bloom and a black Juliet right now on Broadway and are just trying to make it you know modern and hip and I don't know I do think that plays date themselves eventually but there's nothing wrong with that. That's great great question. All right we have one right over here in the middle can who's who's closest Kim? Hi. As a composer myself, I'm interested to hear from the composers. How did you compose on the fly like this? Did you guys go with what mood you wanted to create first and go with the music, or did you, know, did you go with what message you wanted to write? How, what was the process involved in creating music so rapidly? Do you want to go first? Sibelius. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful little program. Um, it, it, uh, it allows us to score very, very quickly. Um, I think that because of the dramatic element of, of, of theater, you want to best uh, personify or best forward what's going on on stage dramatically. And so from that perspective, at least for me, so from that perspective, my palette is pretty, pretty clear. 
And so it's an idea of, as a creative artist, you come to that divide of what's more important, that my voice is heard or that people understand what I'm saying. And so when, you come, when I come to that, I tend to shade towards, a, towards understanding because from my perspective, if people don't understand my music, then it doesn't matter what I'm saying. So, and that allows, the more that I can create that, take, put, on, put, in, uh, put in filters and direct what my intention is, then I can say, okay, well this person needs, this song needs four chords. Where at, for this idea, or this idea is an extended sequence, so I need to move someplace. Um, and again, seriously, with the advent of, of scoring software like Finale or Sibelius, um, I'm in the Sibelius camp. Um, <laughs> It allows, me, it allows me to create, I could actually create, I had to, when we got rid of one song, we replaced it with something else, and I actually created that in the room while we were rehearsing. And so by the end of rehearsal, I had a song for the performers to, to write. So if you know what's going on creatively or dramatically, then it, it becomes a lot clearer. Yeah, I feel as far as like creating quickly, um, it's it actually, I mean, it's scary, but it has its advantages as well because you don't have the time to to edit and you mm -hmm. kind of just have to go. Like we had a similar situation, what's today? Sunday? So yesterday. <laughs> 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 yesterday on our lunch break, we I was watching this number and I was like, this is a disaster and this makes no sense and we have to do this tomorrow at noon. So. We better figure out, you know, and on the lunch break, I, same thing, I went home and kind of like threw something together. I mean, as far as, I think it's the same thing. It's like if the idea is clear, um, the music can, it, it comes out of that. I also think that in our piece, there's a lot of, a, a lot of information being given through the music. And I think that um, particularly shifts of things and echoes of things, I'm really trying to like, to, to color this, the scenes, because we have a lot of underscoring and incidental stuff going on. I think um, y y there, what was the question? How do I write this fast? <laughs> I'm so tired. You don't understand. <laughs> How do I write fast, right? That's the question. Yeah, I just stay up really late and just keep writing until it's done. I don't know. <laughs> All right, we have a question down here. You have the mic. Yes, card. this is for the creators of Cubamore. Uh, and the spirituality and the rhythm that you found in Cuba. Now, you know, there's a lot there. And I just wondered if you had a struggle with how much of that you were going to try to convey to an audience which is largely unfamiliar with that, even though it's huge, but it's mostly underground. The short answer is yes. Uh, huge, um, and in in my experience, I, I was passingly familiar with Cuban music, but because of Vince's background as an Afro-Cuban percussionist and, and whatnot, for me it was also kind of to tag back to your question, finding what aspects of that music best inform the character in certain moments and best inform certain moments in the story. So there are moments for us that are completely diegetic, like the blessing, the Asa which, because that is a very specific hymn to Oshun, worked perfectly in that moment for Oshun to come down and impart that information. And then there are other elements rhythmically that we found that had certain messages that Vince was able to find, oh, this is perfect for that moment or that moment. Yeah, I, it, again, the short answer is yes. It is difficult because we don't know what the audience understands, especially being in it. Once you're in it, see, we've done all the research. We, we, so there's things that we take for granted that we already know. Um, one of the more difficult things was finding out how to put it in, put it in a way that okay, the audience gets enough of what they do understand, and and you can and you have a and we have a base and we can and people can learn from there, um, <clears throat> and that's what we that's what, honestly what we tried to do. We tried to say okay, one of the characters dramatically is Zoe. Zoe is a person much like me when I first went to Cuba the first time, because I'm American. And so if you can start incorporating the story from the perspective of how things unfold around this character, then the audience can hopefully go with us as you learn more about the spirituality, the Orisha culture, the, the, what, what's Cuban. Because at some point, it was new to all of us. Mm -hmm. And 
we had to go back to that period of time. Okay, I salsa, I understand the, 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 the beat, the step, okay, how did I learn it? And that's how we did it, both, and music helps. Um, you sing a song, a ballad, you understand a ballad, you sing something that's in a spiritual context, and you try to fill in the connective tissue. So that's what we try to do, and it was a challenge, yes it was. It, it also became a bigger metaphor for us about the Americans trying to understand the Cubans and the Cubans trying to understand the Americans. Absolutely. So it, it kind of looped back on itself the deeper we got into the process. That's great, all right, in the back. So we've discussed Williamstown's process and the process here at TheaterWorks, but as more and more theaters are workshopping new plays and doing festivals, what's most beneficial, or at least what are the qualities that are most beneficial to you as playwrights? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Tiring them out, I think, is really. <laughs> uh, well, I thought this was great. I really did. I, I, I liked... Um, I've never worked where you got to see it and then you get a, a, a day off to work on it. And I learned so much in previews, when my plays are in previews and you have an audience and then you rehearse the next afternoon. And um, I've never worked like this before, but I, I found it uh, very helpful for this play. Yeah, I would say the multiple reading process or presentation process is very helpful and I know that there's a lot of you know, the O'Neill does that. There's a lot of people who do that. I, I, I think it's helpful to write something, put it up, get feedback, and then go back. And, and you, you think that you're learning a lot in a room and actually, you know, talking to people and discovering things, but you really learn by being in an audience while, you're, while your play or musical is being presented. That's what really teaches you what works what's confusing, and what needs to be explored more. And it's really, really fascinating. I'll also say the incredible support of the staff, like our stage manager, Karen Spaller, and Tom Bruett, and, and the, they get that writers have specific needs, and sometimes that need is to be left alone. And sometimes that need is that your computer broke at 2 a.m. and you have to find a component to fix it. And anything, no matter how wild it was, was answered within a very short time period for us. And that, that amount of support in, in the rehearsal studio and also here in the theater was just incredible. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. All right, we have time for one more question. I see one hand right down here. I'm curious as to how the particular actors that were chosen to voice and portray your characters helped shape how you saw your piece and maybe how it might progress in the future versus a different actor who might have done it in a, in a way that gave you a different reaction to it. I want to start off by saying a big thank you to Leslie Martinson, the casting director who put together this. I'll go into a little bit, the process here is a little bit different than for a typical show because typically you audition actors and then you have callbacks and that can take weeks, months, uh, it can take a long time to cast a show. Here, uh, Leslie puts together a pitch of, of two actors and some maybe some YouTube clips of them and, uh, and, and passes them along and says, you know, we, these are some fantastic actors, what do you think? Uh, so it's, it's really cast sort of un, unseen. Um, which is very different than most, most, most processes. So who I wants mean, to talk actors, about that? They contribute to the process so much that it's almost hard to sort of sum it up <laughs> in, in a sound bite, you know. Um, but I find it so helpful when I have really smart actors, as all of these were, uh, and, you know, and they ask the right questions. Well, why am I saying this? Oh, hang on. <laughs> uh, maybe that's me. Um, uh, you know, I mean, that's so helpful, watching them figure out the emotional through line of the characters. And um, one of my actors, Dale Souls, um, who played Hazel, has been with my piece ever since the very first reading when I had it at the Juilliard School. Um, and so, I mean, I really feel that that character in particular has been developed around her. Um, and yeah, <laughs> she's absolutely indispensable to the piece, as I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah, I had never uh, 
uh, done a workshop experience where I didn't know any of the actors. Um, they were all uh, suggested by Leslie, and we just said, okay. <laughs> and uh, we were very happy with who we had because you, uh, I had written a play with specific actors in mind in New York and worked only with those people before. And so you just get new questions when you work with new people. And then you also get very different interpretations of the play. And um, if, you, uh, if everything goes well, you would hope that your play would be done in more than one place. And you won't always be there to uh, say, no, you have to do it. It's kind of like trying to get uh, the, the Jody character to do it like Marilyn and Mr. Felt. You don't have that kind of control <laughs> to, um, uh, and so it's interesting just uh, to see how your play translates with different actors and different audiences and um, uh, how much of it is uh, on the page and, and how much the actor brings. Yeah, I, feel, I felt incredibly lucky if you saw my piece, the actors were so game. Uh, they were just <laughs> throwing themselves, doing like flips and <laughs> <laughs> falling all over themselves and I was I was amazed I was they they couldn't have been more delightful and, and gifted and I, I got just so much from working with them what about the musicals any anything about because especially having singers that you haven't have or haven't worked with before is that um, I mean I think we were particularly blown away by by the actress who played Sylvia Sharon Rootkirk because mm -hmm. she we had never met her she's wonderful and we feel like you know she's I mean the play hinges on her and us us feeling for her and we were you know a little bit nervous about coming in with an actress that we never met before and she was just so she's wonderful wonderful she's and wonderful. game and you know I mean everyone it's it's like we're get, we're giving them new we gave them new pages today before our reading at noon and they were just like okay like I don't know how they you know it was they're they're you know again like the support of theater works and the support of those actors is really special and it was wonderful yeah our actors became a family uh, it, and I love that the, they came here and it's like we're all part of this process and we're in it together and as a performer I can understand that but when things get difficult then that camaraderie can become challenged and they were so smart and so game and we, we received some actors, some potential actors that we said no to. We were very specific about who we wanted and Theater Works worked with us and, and they work, Theater Works worked very hard to provide us what, what, with what we wanted. And so when we got there, we were, got in here, we were so impressed with what they brought to the table that we had to look at ourselves and say, well, are we giving them <laughs> enough of what enough. they need? Because yeah. they were provide. well, what do you think about this similarly? And, uh, and uh, well, would Oshun, well, I don't know what Oshun. <laughs> James, you know. I, no, you yeah. take it. So, <laughs> and, and, and they contribute to what we create. And this is not the first time that we've actually, we, that we've had certain, these had characters read. And we were able to find out how much we didn't know. Yeah. When we thought that we knew, no, this character is this, we realized on another take, well, maybe I'm wrong. Well, maybe yeah. this is the way, this, this interpretation of the character is more accurate or works better for the story. It was absolutely invaluable to have live bodies, not just bouncing the questions, but bouncing the energy of our piece mm -hmm. with the music and so much. And we changed keys for certain characters and that completely changed the color, the timbre of certain moments. Um, that, that was such a huge aspect. And, and you know, performers like, like Omari who, <laughs> he created all of those different characterizations of Alegua for us, and we had never seen that. So that, that was such a huge gift for that kind of depth to come out of just two weeks of work. Well, great. Well, please join me in giving these artists an incredibly big round of applause. All right, thank you. Hope to see you at the 8 p.m. reading of Gather at the River. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>